Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. We are live for, and I'm pleased to announce this, the 104th episode of Heart of Poland, where we go on the impossible mission to discover the heart of Poland. Well, it turns out that today's guest, multiple Emmy Award winning travel journalist Peter Greenberg. Welcome, Peter. Happy to be with you. It turns out that Peter's been on a bit of a mission himself. He's been on a mission to discover the heart of Poland, and he had a slightly better guide than most people do when they go on the uh, mission to discover the heart of Poland. Uh, Peter, it's almost a year and a bit since um, the episode, the Royal Tour of Poland, which you, you did, came out. And it's, a, it's quite a wacky format. I want to know who came up with the idea of spending this time with these dignitaries and, and heads of state. Well, believe it or not, it goes back more than 20 years ago. I was in Jordan. We were doing one of my television shows. And as a producer, you'll appreciate this. I needed a helicopter. And <laughs> I was told by all the authorities that the only person who controlled the helicopters in Jordan was the prince who commanded special forces. I said, can I have a meeting with him? <laughs> well, we had a meeting. We got along very, very well. We ended up becoming friends. We got the helicopter. Uh, we finished our shoot. And that night, I had dinner with him. And we started talking about the fact that back in 1998, most Americans were terrified of going anywhere in the Middle East, let alone uh, Jordan. And it was in the middle of the intifada and craziness. And I said to him, you know, I got a great idea. Why don't I come over? We'll do a one hour special and you'll be my guy. It'll just be the two of us and we'll go through we'll go through Jordan. He said, great. Um, we kept up those discussions for a while. And then all of a sudden. His father, King Hussein, uh, became very, very ill, uh, was dying. And on his deathbed, he called his son, the prince, to his room and said, uh, you're going to be the king. And his son said, but but, sir, I never aspired to the job. I was supposed to go to his uncle, the crown prince. And the king said, that's why you're getting the job. You never okay. aspired to it. And all of a sudden he became king. And then all of my ideas kind of went out the window because he was immediately surrounded by the royal court. No one would let anybody get near him. And I said, I know he wants to do this. So I flew on my own to Amman. I found out what his schedule was. Um, I was He was coming to a hotel the next morning for an inspection. So I got there two hours early and sat in the lobby. And he walked in with his entourage of 40 people. Most of them had already told me no. And he looked at me and he said, <laughs> what are you doing here? And I said, remember that thing we talked about? Are you ready to do it? He said, absolutely. He said, can I come see you tomorrow at the palace? He said, absolutely. And the next day I was in the palace and all of his advisors were trying to talk him out of it. Uh, they were saying, you know, your majesty, it's not the right, 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 the, the right moment. It's not, the, and this is not prestigious enough and it's not the right time in the Middle East. And I interrupted and I said, excuse me, but when has it ever been the right time in the Middle East? And the king looked at me and he said, he's absolutely right. I'm doing this. And they said, but your majesty. And I said, and he looked at him and he said, excuse me, I'm the king. And I looked at him and I said, I love it when you say that. And that started 20 years ago. We shot the very first royal tour with royalty in this case. It was the King of Jordan. And we did some amazing things. By the way, that show is still on the air. Uh, and I mean, we did Har we did Petra on Harley. Uh, we, we dove the Red Sea. We climbed mountains. We did whitewater rafting in Jordan. Think about that. Uh, nobody even knows they had it. Uh, and, and as a result of that, I realized we had a franchise here that could go globally and we could literally see countries through the eyes of their leaders in a way that was that would humanize the country, might even humanize the leader. But it would give people a, a different window into a world that they otherwise wouldn't have seen. And the rule is, I should tell you, that they had no co creative control. Yes. They had no editorial review. The very first time that the king saw it was when we had a premiere uh, in, in New York. The very first time that uh, Prime Minister you know, Morawiecki saw it uh, was in, you know, when we had the premiere. In, in a York. salt mine. Oh, well, that was afterwards. Yes, we did the salt mine. We did that. Exactly. That was amazing that night. Let me tell you. That, yeah. They did it up. Uh, it was great. So, so that's how fast forward, started. Peter, fast forward 20, 18 years, I guess, yeah. to Poland and the invitation comes out to come and visit Poland. How much did you know about Poland? What were your preconceived notions? Because let's be honest, I think I think speaking as someone who was born in Britain, most people think of Poland as a dull, gray, maybe not very friendly country. I grew up during the Cold War. Uh, I remember my first images of Poland that I saw on television were black and white and dreary and depressing very Soviet bloc-esque. Um, 
And so I was blown away when I first came to Poland and I saw things literally in living color. And I saw that you had an amazing respect for your history, but also an, Amer an amazing embrace of innovation and the future. And I said, the world needs to see this. And so when I sat with the prime minister and explained what I wanted to do, he was all on board um, and we did it. And that's how it started. Oh, let's be clear then. You then travel at, at, at breakneck speed. It's six days in total with the with the head of state, in this case, the Polish Prime Minister, Mateusz Morawiecki. And yes. it's six days in a row or you spread out over time? It was about nine days because we had some weather issues on two of the days, but they were more or less consecutive days, uh, literally crisscrossing the country by by helicopter, by plane, by car, by boat, you by Navy destroyer. Yes. I mean, you name it, we figured out a way to get there. <laughs> now, I've done a little bit of television filming myself, and if there's one word to describe it, I'll call it hectic. It sounds like it's quite a tiring week. How is it a prime minister can fit in his day job whilst whilst working for you, Peter, as your guide? Well, let's let's call it not that he was working for me. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't happen. But here's, I think, what happens. Once I sit down with the head of state and explain what the show is, what the audience is, the importance of the largest industry in the world, which happens to be travel and tourism, uh, they get it. They understand how important it is for people to see a country, in many cases, for the very first time. Uh, and, then, and then what happens is they really get into it um, and they become enthusiastic. In fact, they come up with ideas of their own that are, in many cases, better than ours. Uh, now, we have a crew, I should tell you. When I do a normal television show, I might have a crew of seven to 10 people. On royal tours, we are at 43. We have our own aerial unit. We have our own dive unit, our under underwater unit, motorcycle unit, bicycle unit. We have specialist mountain climbing units. So, um, you know, we shot in every conceivable way in, in this show. And, uh, and plus, the reason why we have such a big crew, we don't get a second chance. We can't say, oh, listen, can you come back tomorrow? We didn't quite get it. <laughs> no, you better get it the first time. I can imagine that on the other side, the prime minister's crew are probably looking the whole time at their clocks thinking, oh, this is going oh, on a bit longer, the weather. I will, I will tell you this, and this is without exception, every country you've ever been in, the people who are the gatekeepers to the heads of state think we're crazy. <laughs> who are the gatekeepers to the heads of state do everything they can initially to go, no, this has never been done before. We're not going to do this yet. And what happens is it's usually the head of state after the first day of shooting that goes, Oh, yeah, I do want to ride a bike. I do want to jump in the wall. I do want to go in a balloon. And then we just do it. And at the end of it, everybody's friends, because we've gone through this experience together, and they realized there really was a purpose to this, and we really were able to tell a story. Yeah, I've been a gatekeeper for various uh, senior government ministers in the UK, and I know exactly the look they give. It's that, you know, can't interrupt, but these guys are getting on way too well for our calendar purposes. All right, so Peter, let's talk about, um, first of all, how many times have you been to Poland before you filmed the Royal Tour? And and, and what years was that? How had, you, had you seen the change gradually, or, or did, had you come back after a long time to do this program? Well, I saw the change gradually, and then I saw it suddenly, if that makes any <laughs> sense. Uh, I go back to the 80s. Uh, before the fall uh, of, of the Soviet Empire. And so I saw it then, um, and I then saw it in the 90s. And then I hadn't gotten back there for at least 15 years. And then when I came back to do the scouting and the advance work, that's when I was just blown away. A lot has changed, hasn't it? More or less in the same time I started coming to Poland in 2007 or something. It's, it's yes. boom, a completely different country. Um, so where did you go then, Peter? Where, where were the, you mentioned some of the ways that you got around. Where were the top top uh, tips? And where, where did the prime minister take you that was slightly unusual, maybe off the beaten path? Well, the one that was off the beaten path for me uh, was the Hell Peninsula. Uh, and I said, how are we going to get there? He says, well, I have access to a boat. Next thing you know, we're, we're on a destroyer. Um, that was wild. I have to tell you, that was wild. And uh, we had a great time. Uh, I discovered, of course, when we went to a restaurant in Hell, that uh, he's not a big fan of herring. Uh, but uh, other than that, we had a great time. Uh, that was one. Uh, we, went, uh, we went out on the, on the very famous sailboat that you may remember, uh, the one that was used to smuggle all the secrets. Yes. Um, and that was a great story. Keep in mind that the, the, the beauty of these shows is that the heads of state get to be storytellers. They're not just my tour guide saying, look at this museum, or isn't that a beautiful tree? No, they're telling you things in perspective and context that you otherwise would never understand. And that made the biggest difference. 
Yeah, so I think in the Prime Minister's case, I've, I've interviewed him twice myself. You know, the guy's a historian, really. His, his knowledge yeah. of history is absolutely fantastic. Uh, uh, and he's seen the country from many different perspectives as a member of, of Fighting Solidarity. Um, so, and his uh, father, too, and his father. And his father, who sadly passed away, uh, I think, at the end of last year, actually. Oh, yes. the time has gone on crazy. Peter, I just want to do a little segue and talk about coronavirus and travel. Yeah. You're on the road the whole time. Um, you, you don't seem to ever have a put a foot down for longer than five minutes before you're off somewhere else. How has coronavirus impacted you and your work? Well, this is but only my second international trip. I'm actually talking today from, from Turkey. This is only my second international trip since March, which to me is like like light years because yeah. uh, I normally travel over 450,000 miles a year. It's what I do. Uh, that means I'm on the road 8,000 miles a week. Uh, so for, from March till just about last month, I was a barricaded suspect in New York, um, doing all of my shows from a bunker, if you will, uh, both television and radio. Uh, but I will tell you this, there is a slight silver lining in this. It's given me a lot of time to think, to read, to, to put things in proper perspective so that I'm really preparing myself to get back and travel again. Uh, from here, I'll be going to Croatia in about four days, from Croatia down to a hot spot in Florida, then back to, the, back to uh, New York in time for the election, and then traveling again, more than likely to both South America and Saudi Arabia. So things are starting to slowly turn around. I would not in any way, shape or form uh, be silly enough to say it's bouncing back because it's not. Uh, it's creeping back. It's going to take some time. Yes. And I think this is a message that's come out a lot, which is people saying, well, it's bad, but there has always been, there's been a positive out of this. And uh, if ever there was a, a country that was a good example of how things can be bad and then bounce back positively, it's Poland. How yes. much did you know about Poland's um, tragic, difficult, uh, and I also think inspiring past? You went, for example, to Auschwitz and you've said you're on record as saying that was a really difficult emotional day for obvious reasons. You cannot avoid being affected by a trip to Auschwitz. In our case, it was even uh, more special for me uh, because we went there at five in the morning. We shot as the sun was trying to poke through the mist as we walked down those railroad tracks and into the, into the facility. And we were the only ones there. Uh, and so when the prime minister is telling me the story and we're going to the barracks and seeing the display, which if you've not seen it, I think every school child must see it so that we grow up with an understanding of history so that we don't repeat it. Uh, but when you walk in there and see the display of, uh, of luggage, that, the, the luggage display was amazing to me because people brought their bags with them thinking they were only going to stay a while and leave. And, and then, of course, as they found out very quickly, no one left. And then the one that I had to stop the cameras on was when we got to the children's shoes. Uh, when you saw that, you can't avoid it. it it's overwhelming. Um, and that part of history, uh, everybody should remember so we never repeat it. Uh, and that was an important part of our, of our story. Yes. Let's turn on perhaps to uh, to happier times. And you're, you're quite right. Everyone should go. Uh, and your program is taking it, obviously, to people who, who can't go. Um, where's your favorite place in Poland, Pete? And I'm so sorry I have to ask you this very obvious question that everyone's asked you a million times, but it's it's a goodie. Wow. Well, I'll give you a couple. I, I, don't, I can't give you one. Uh, oh. I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't do it. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a couple. One is that what most people don't realize, and I didn't realize it either till I really spent some time and immersed myself there, you guys have more castles than anybody else in the world. It's unbelievable. It was sort of like in the middle of everybody invading Poland, they all said, let's build five more castles. And you did. Um, and so there, if you have time to spend, not at the, at the most well-known castles, because that, that goes without saying, but some of the smaller castles that tell a different story, uh, and you get there either late in the afternoon or early in the morning when the light is just right, that's where you have an, an opportunity to sit back and, and, and think. The other favorite thing I did uh, was that we discovered, uh, I went gliding at one point over the Tatras Mountains. Uh, that wasn't in the Royal Tour. Uh, we did that as a separate piece called Hidden Poland. And to tell the story of those mountains and their historical significance when you're up there with no sound at all other than the wind that you're flying against uh, or flying with is uh, pretty amazing. 
Wow, Peter, boy, have you led an interest in a varied life, and that's just Poland alone. Um, Peter, I wonder, uh, as a traveller, you always get annoyed about something. There must have been something about that experience in Poland, which, uh, shall we say, was somewhat frustrating. What was that thing, Peter? Can you reveal for us an exclusive? We like exclusives on Hot <laughs> Well, it's the one thing you can't control. It's the weather. And <laughs> one day, we, we, we always try to do a really good opening shot. It happens to be our most expensive shot. And if you miss it, you, you, there's no way to go back because you can't afford it. And and uh, it was at a castle, as a matter of fact. And uh, the idea was to, to have the prime minister at the top of this castle at the right time of the day where we reveal him overlooking all this expansive countryside from that vantage point. And it was pouring rain. It was beating down. We had a helicopter on hold at a nearby airfield. We were running out of time. We were running out of light. And then we got a report that the clouds were going to break uh, for only 11 minutes. And, and seriously, and we launched the helicopter. And you know what? We got the shot. But that was a very uh, intense time while we were all waiting uh, because we'd come all the way just to this one castle to get that one shot. But we got it. Well, uh, yeah, and that's in a nutshell. People just don't see the story behind the story. There's always a story behind the story, and that's why I'm so happy to have Peter here to find out more about the Royal Tour, which, ladies and gentlemen, I forgot to mention at the start, you can access and view by clicking on the two links which I've included in the description to this video. So feel free to do that on Amazon and iTunes, although local purchasing requirements may uh, apply. Poland, did you spend uh, so much time with Polish people? I did. Um, and you know what? I, I learned very quickly that the cuisine goes way beyond pierogies. Um, although the pierogies are pretty good. Um, and, you know, you, you, you do the night food scene in Warsaw, and that's where you meet everybody. Oh, my God. I mean, that's where I really, really saw the changes in just all the food offerings in Warsaw. And you know what? It was amazing. I mean, to me, we look forward. To, the, the problem was we had very early mornings, so we couldn't stay up very late at night. But to me, I look forward to, uh, to going out to dinner knowing I wasn't going to be coming back anytime soon because it was it was going late into the night. But you guys have excelled in the cuisine department, which most, at least Americans, would never, ever imagine. You know, they, they just think it's it's pierogies and that's it, you know. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, po 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 Polish kielbasa. Although, although, I will tell you, the one thing that drove me nuts, okay, you asked for nuts? Oh, this is nuts. Yes. When we're traversing the countryside and we're going in our motorcades, uh, with all of our camera crews and the trucks and the vans and all the other vehicles, we'd stop you know, for gas or for a rest stop. I've had it with Polish gas station hot dogs. I, <laughs> not, I do not ever want to see another one again. Okay, uh, but because we knew what was going to await us every time we got there. <laughs> again. But other than that, I love Poland. There, there's something weird about those hot dogs because despite myself on more than one occasion, I, I completely agree. You just eat them and then afterwards you're, you're kind of instantly regretting them. No, no, you eat them, them and then you go, what was I thinking? <laughs> 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 Ladies and gentlemen, that's a heart of Poland exclusive. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> of, we've had we've had better exclusives on the show, but I'll still say that's one of my okay. favorites. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> Peter, the show has been airing on PBS ever since uh, it came on and elsewhere around the world. And of course, you did um, pre premieres, as they say in American English, yes. uh, across the US. H how was it received? Amazing. Uh, we did. We, we, in fact, we weren't ready for how big it was going to be received. We did a premiere in Los Angeles uh, at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences for the Hollywood community. Then we went to Chicago to the Lyric Opera House. That opera house holds almost 4,000 people, and you couldn't find a seat. Now, obviously, in Chicago, it's the largest you know, population of, of Polish people outside of Warsaw, but I mean, everybody showed up. And that was quite an evening, which lasted way, way longer than we thought. And then we jumped on a plane that night, literally like at two in the morning, flew to New York just in time to do all the morning television shows and all the events around around the premiere there. And then we had the premiere that night at the historic and prestigious Guggenheim Museum. And at each one of these premieres, I spoke, the prime minister spoke, the audience was out, was allowed to ask any questions they wanted. It was it was quite an event. Yes, the pictures from there are quite impressive. We've got a pic uh, question here from Swavamir. So ladies and gentlemen, we always invite questions if you're on our live feed. Uh, which soup do you prefer? Did you try any Polish soups? I'm sure that's probably a rhetorical question. You know what? The answer is I didn't, um, and and the reason is 
soup always makes me feel heavy. And, and we were rolling so fast, I didn't. Uh, but, but in any case, uh, I will come back and try it, but I didn't do it. I, I got, got to say the truth, I didn't do it. I already see a cooking program where I'll take you to, uh, I've got a fantastic little studio where, where we cook, we cook Polish food. So if you're looking for perfect Polish Zurek, for example, you can find it on Heart of Poland can, because I have cooked it, uh, admittedly rather amateurly, uh, with, uh, with a fantastic Italian chef who did it. So Peter, if you want to come to Poland and do that, you need to come to. Okay, I'm sorry I missed out, but I'll be, you know I'm coming back, so don't worry. Oh, we're counting it. Let's do. You know, I think. I think we need to meet up with Peter and spend some time teaching him how to cook Shurek. Um, Peter, uh, now there's one sort of rather humiliating moment in your trip to Poland where you're taken into a room at the national stadium, and it turns out that people are playing ping pong. Well, Tell you us know what? what? In the in the uh, <laughs> let's let's talk about transparency here. Um, <laughs> but you know, when I'm with a head of state and the head of state says, "Do you want to do X?" You go, "Okay." So he said you want to play ping pong? I said, sure. He didn't bother to tell me he was like a national champion. And so if you, you see the video, we didn't doctor that video. I never saw the ball. It just came <laughs> by me at, at like hypersonic speed. Uh, I mean, I think the, the final score was like 21 to zero. I mean, it was that bad. I, but, I watched uh, it. You got a point. So I get a point? okay, you know, that, I, I blocked that out because I can't remember me even getting a point. But if I did, <laughs> I'll, I'll take your word for it. He was um, he was amazing because anytime I hit the ball, I knew what was coming at me. I just couldn't react to it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is one of the amusing moments from Peter's wild, rapid, fast moving, informative and uh, fascinating visit to uh, Poland, the Royal Tour. Um, he did well, wasn't with royalty, but he was with about as high up as you can possibly get. Um, however, I've always said if Poland wants to bring back royalty, then Her Majesty the Queen is available. Uh, and I'm sure they can have some kind of agreement. It'd be good to get a colony back, one or two. We seem to be losing more and more. Peter, thank you very much for joining us on this special trip to the heart of Poland. Any final thoughts for the people of Poland watching this now all around the world on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter, on thefirstnews.com? Yes. Anybody who wants to invite me back, I hereby accept. I've never felt more welcomed. Uh, I've never felt happier. Uh, and it was it was a dramatic surprise because remember, I grew up watching Poland in black and white. And now, uh, thanks to this show and many others to follow, I suppose, everybody gets to see it in color. And uh, that's a big deal. Well, that was just honey to my heart, as the polls say. So that made me feel very good indeed. Thank you very much, Peter Greenberg. It's really a pleasure. We've got a, a comment here from Alina. It's always fun to hear what foreigners have to say about our Poland. Well, I think, ladies and gentlemen, since Heart of Poland is a fairly regal affair, we can make now Peter an unofficial citizen of Poland for his hard work, traveling, <laughs> eating the hot dogs. No, <laughs> not the hot dogs. No, not the hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this was the 104th episode of Heart of Poland. Thank you very much for joining us, Peter. It's been a pleasure hearing your story. And we'll see you again for another episode of Heart of Poland, which is, of course, the premier English language program. 104 episodes, can you believe it? So if you are interested in talking to authors, travelers, uh, poets, historians, change makers, people who are living fascinating lives in the fascinating country of Poland, then Heart of Poland is your place. And I invite you to come back to the firstnews.com, which is the best English language source of news about Poland. So thank you, Peter. I, I think we'll be seeing each other again. I have this strange feeling. So let's make that happen. See you soon. Okay.